Have you ever been excited by a new idea, inspired by watching someone lead by example? When we talk about creating change, we start by sharing the stories of everyday heroes who are making a difference in their own way so we can learn and do the same. This truth is the power behind this show, which celebrates organizations and individuals who are leading by example to give back, fuel change, and create new opportunities for the Mid-South. I'm Jeremy Park, and this is The Spark Awards. The 2015 Spark Awards is made possible by... Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance has been serving the Memphis community for over 60 years. We're excited to help honor those who share our goal of supporting our community and igniting positive change in the Mid-South. Lipscomb and Pitts is proud to be a sponsor of the Spark Awards. Champion Awards in Apparel bring brands to life and make it easy for individuals and organizations to promote their cause and celebrate achievement. Champion is proud to have created the custom Spark Award statue and sponsor the Spark Awards. The Rotary Club of Memphis is grounded in the principle of fellowship through service, and we are proud to sponsor the 2015 Spark Award and to recognize and celebrate those in our community who cherish and embody our same values of service to others. We'd also like to thank these supporters of the Spark and the promotional partners of the Spark Awards 2015. Welcome to the second annual Spark Awards show. The Spark Awards recognizes and honors individuals, nonprofits, corporations, and schools in 13 different categories who are igniting change and making a positive impact in the greater Memphis community. And now your host, Tom Prestigiacomo. Thank you, Rob Grayson, and indeed, welcome. I'm very thrilled to be able to be your host for the second annual Spark Awards. This is an incredible gathering of some of the most inspiring people in the Mid-South. And I know because WKNO, we've spent the last several weeks getting to know all of our Spark Award winners. We pre-interviewed you, we interviewed you. You permitted us to send cameramen to wander through your workplaces, and you helped our editors dig through your photo archives so that we could help tell your stories. And that's exactly what we're going to do as we give out these 13 different awards. Jeremy Park had a chance to sit down and talk with each of the honorees. So tonight, we'll be listening to your story in your own words. And these stories remind us that one person can choose to take a few simple steps to help others. And over the course of a day, a week, a year, or a lifetime, those small steps can climb mountains. You can change lives, and committing to that effort changes your own life. Now, let me share the stage for a moment with the man who keeps the spark blazing, the president of the Lipscomb Pitts Breakfast Club and host of the TV show, The Spark, ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Park. You can't be what you can't see. Memphis is famously known for its generosity. There are countless individuals every day giving back and making a difference here in the Mid-South. And on our end as the public, we need to see their efforts and their impact to be inspired to make a difference ourselves. Three years ago, we launched a TV series called The Spark. And that became the foundation for launching the Spark Awards so that we could see the efforts of 13 different individuals and organizations to thank them, to celebrate their efforts, but on our end to be inspired to be a spark in our community. Let's learn now about the process for selecting this year's winners from the Rotary Club of Memphis. The Rotary Club of Memphis is an organization of 200 members who actively participate in a variety of community service projects. For over a century, Rotary has been serving and giving back in the Mid-South, which is why we are proud to be a partner in the Spark Awards. Our members reviewed the nominations received from the general public earlier this year, and we consider the, uh, the nominees' philanthropic leadership, volunteerism and activism, and impact within our five-county Memphis metro area before selecting the winners in each category. The Rotary Club of Memphis is pleased to help present this year's winners of the Spark Awards. Our first award category focuses on corporate philanthropy. We're blessed in the Mid-South with so many generous companies who are engaged in giving back at all levels. Corporations have always played a vital role in the success of our nation and our city. They are the providers of goods and services, the engines for growth, job creation, and economic development. But when business leaders and their companies become engaged, they also can become powerful catalysts for change. Presenting the corporate awards tonight is Chief Manager of Lipscomb and Pitts Insurance, Johnny Pitts. 
We have three divisions for the corporate awards, which are classified by the number of employees. So our first division will be for companies with under 100 employees. DataFX is a consumer reporting agency established in 1989. We're in the business of background screening and lending solutions, and essentially we're providing information lenders and employers can rely on to make sound lending and hiring decisions. DataFax is passionate on a number of fronts, one of which is Youth Villages. Youth Villages does amazing work. It's, it's really a diamond in our backyard, and they're now a model across the nation for others. Uh, we have found it very valuable to engage with them with their holiday program, not only sponsoring children, but the holiday program for the foster families. We engage on all the holidays, Easter egg hunts, uh, 60 dozen eggs, so fun, uh, Valentine's, cupcakes, pumpkins. So we try to, to engage with youth villages on, across all the holidays and also with at-risk girls and the residents with co-creation art workshops. And you, your, your team, you're, you're baking the cupcakes, you're wrapping the gifts, so it's not necessarily you're just sponsoring, I mean, you're hands-on, you're Absolutely. bringing all these to life. Absolutely. The Kaboom uh, Playground was one example. We were out there, I, I, I was in charge of or working with concrete, I hope the place is still standing, that was fun. Um, you know, they're, they're stuffing the eggs, they're hiding the eggs, they're, you know, r face painting at the holiday party, and it's just a joy that, that the, the giving spirit at DataFax is so abundant. Talk about Make-A-Wish. Make-A-Wish, another um, very big passion at DataFacts. It, it's just such a joy to, to see that you can have a, an effect on a child with a life-threatening illness. Uh, one of the wishes that we did for Make-A-Wish was just so cool. Uh, seeing the little boy's face, we all dressed up as superheroes and Disney characters, and, and he was just so wowed and amazed that we were doing this for him. He, he, was, he was very ill, uh, but was able to, to go on the, uh, the Disney trip, and he was so excited, and, and you're just so pleased to have maybe touched that life in, in, a, in a very special way. And when you can help change lives, or extend lives, or touch lives, it's, you are the greater recipient. As a native Memphian and as a Memphis-based business, I think it's incumbent upon us to, to do all that we can for Memphis and on behalf of Memphis. You must be invested in the community where you live, work, and play. And we try to do that in Memphis and across all the communities that we touch. It's just our responsibility. And above all, I truly, truly believe that too much has been given, much is expected. And it, it's our responsibility to do all that we can for as long as we can, for as many as we can, and, and to say yes as often as possible. Daphne is the founder of DataFacts, receiving her Spark Award from Johnny Pitts. Our second award category in the corporate category is for companies with 100 to 499 employees. Phelps Security is a uh, family-owned company in Memphis. It was founded in 1953 by my father. Uh, today we have uh, my wife and my three children involved in it and uh, uh, we wear our name on our sleeve very proudly and we're glad to be here serving the Memphis uh, and Mid-South area. Security Guard Service is just uh, one part of it, but it's a major part of what we do. Uh, you know, we provide officers through uh, different locations throughout Memphis, be it medical, schools, uh, industrial. Uh, we do also, one of the facets is private investigative. Uh, one of the other areas, divisions we have is a commercial and residential patrol. Well, one of the things that you're known for is called Big for Memphis, mm -hmm. and it's business interest group. And it's bringing the MPD, the Memphis Police Department, together with business and community leaders right. to be able to share tips. Give us an idea of what Big for Memphis is. Well, Big for Memphis is uh, a project I'm very proud of. Uh, you know, I guess to say it came about uh, through my relationships with law enforcement community as well as my business community and uh, where I'd have a lot of my uh, clients come to me asking me to connect with my network with my law enforcement friends and 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 I see a need for the business community and the law enforcement community to, to connect to the business community and some of the things I see in Memphis today is or in any city as it may be that uh, that's a that's a, something we all need is to have that connection and relationship with our law enforcement so the other thing that's really important that you do is the Fallen Officer Memorial. Well, Fallen Officer Memorial is definitely a, a passion of mine. I'd like to see it uh, built someday, and it takes a village to do that. 
it would send a tremendous statement throughout the Memphis area that we are all united. We all back the police officers, the ones who's out there giving their lives and, and every day, you know, that they go to work. So it's something that just recognizes those who have fallen and uh, those who serve. So it's a tremendous statement. I think we all can say, uh, you know, we do support our police and, uh, and that we are proud for what they do for us. Memphis is just like all other major cities. We do have our problems, but I think there's just something that Memphis has that no other city has. You know, uh, our, our, our citizens here, uh, we're very proud to live in Memphis and to be in Memphis. And, uh, you know, it's, again, it's, it's my roots and my family. I've got grandkids who'll be here. And I hope to be able to provide a level of uh, safety here uh, that I'll be proud of, that I can trust that they'll grow up in a great city. But it's going to take us all working together. That's going to be the seed and that's going to be the difference in making uh, Memphis a better city. Accepting the award on behalf of Phelps Security is Lloyd Phelps. Our final award in the corporate category is for companies with 500 or more employees. Monogram Food Solutions started in 2004, so we're about 11 years old here in Memphis. My partner Wes Jackson and I started with eight employees then and fast forward to today we have a little over 2,500 with six manufacturing plants around the country and the support center, our headquarters, is here in Memphis. One of the things that you're very well known for is the focus on kids, and you have a foundation, Monogram Loves Kids Foundation. Correct. Give us an idea of the foundation. Sure. One of the behaviors that we value as we started this company is trying to create a culture that would help us grow, and one of the behaviors that we highlight is trying to give back to the communities where our uh, team members live and work. So we're not so big that we can be a solution to everybody's needs, so we decided to focus on children. And so Monogram Loves Kids Foundation was started a little less than five years ago, and we give grants to children's charities in the areas where we have operations. And one of the big events that you put on is called Meet Me in Memphis, and it's not right. M-E-E-T, it's M-E-A-T. Correct, cleverly. this will be our fourth year, and that is our big fundraiser where we uh, solicit sponsorships from people that do business with us and have a live and silent auction and we have eight local chefs and it's always held uh, usually the third Thursday in October of each year in downtown Memphis and we raise over $200,000 a year. And another one is, you alluded to it, but over 10 years, as a part of your 10 year anniversary, you launched a program, a give back program called Impact 10. Describe Impact 10. Yes, it was uh, something that lasted for 10 weeks. We challenged people in the community to nominate their favorite charity. And to nominate the charity, they didn't have to do anything other than commit to do an act of kindness. And over 3,000 people submitted an act of kindness that they would do and in return nominated their charity. And each week for 10 weeks, we chose a charity that we gave $10,000 to initially and then an anonymous uh, donor gave us another 50000 so each of the charities got 15000 You yourself heavily involved in the community, serving on right. boards, volunteering, giving of your time and resources, aligning your expertise, your team, same thing. Talk about why it's so important to be involved in the community. People want to work for companies that give back. People enjoy giving back, and it creates a camaraderie, uh, it, it creates a self-worth as a company. So there's a lot uh, of gifts that are given to us by being part of a giving corporation. That's Carl Sledwitz accepting the Spark Award for Monogram Foods. You know, nonprofits serve a very important role in our community. They're the open door to warm shelter and a hot meal a helping hand when times are tough, and a source of love and encouragement to steer us back on the right path of success. Nonprofits focus on improving the quality of life for others. As with most organizations, relationships with people and the community are at the heart of any nonprofit success. 
Those relationships help support their cause and further their impact. Presenting the Nonprofit Awards tonight is Michael Labonia, President and CEO of WKNO. We have three levels in the Nonprofit Awards divided by operating budgets. Our first award is for nonprofits with an operating budget under $1 million. Camp Good Grief started in 1999. It's the first children's grief camp in the Mid-South, and that's for six to 12 year olds. Over time, that grew into a camp for teenagers, a camp for adults, and then really we needed to put walls around our program and to offer grief counseling all year long. So we have the Kimmins Wilson Family Center for Good Grief staffed by trained professionals. There's six therapists that work there that are mental health providers, but all that we do is free of charge. The camps are free of charge and open to the community, as is the individual grief counseling. We're funded through grants and donations, so fundraising is a huge piece of the work that we do so that we keep this service available for the entire community free of charge. Grief is the most universal experience there is, and we do not want people out there grieving alone. And walk us through, because the center is amazing. You have a special room called the Volcano Room where kids can bash out their anger, so there's a lot of science that goes into what you do. The center is developed on the way that uh, children grieve, the way adolescents grieve, and the way that adults grieve. And they grieve in very different ways. So the children's rooms look more like a playroom, because oftentimes children show their grief through play, where the teens might need more of a physical release. Um, even the adults, we have a room where they can, it's an anger management room where they can express that. We have an outdoor ropes course that we can work with a family as a whole to focus on the changes that they've experienced and how they're trying to create a new normal in their life since their loved one has died. The center is growing. We currently have a waiting list, which is very hard for us, and we don't want people grieving alone. But people are coming to us from all over, even outside of the Mid-South, because there's no other service like this. So with camp each year, we take um, over 100 children to camp, to our camps. We, um, we see over um, 3,000 people individually a year at the Grief Center. So people are coming, and people are coming not just from um, illness-related deaths. We work majority with people who've had a traumatic death. So the schools refer to us, um, other mental health providers, police officers, things like that. While the Junior League of Memphis has had a community partnership with Camp Good Grief, we supply both volunteers and funding for the camp. We believe that this camp changes children. It teaches them how to grieve in a healthy way. Grief can be experienced in many different ways, but it teaches them that they are okay if they want to be sad, if they want to be happy, if they want to talk about their loved one, or if they don't. Um, and what we think, we believe that by teaching them how to grieve, they become more emotionally balanced as adults. And that's important to Memphis, and it's important to the Junior League. That's Angela Hamblin and Katie Grafham receiving the Spark Award from WKNO's Michael Labonia. Our second award in the nonprofit category is for organizations with an operating budget between one and five million dollars. So at the Exchange Club Family Center, our mission is to interrupt the cycle of family violence. That includes domestic violence among intimate partners and also the risk of child abuse, uh, either children who are abused at the hands of their caretakers or children who witness violence among their, their, their caretakers in the home. Somewhere in the beginning 1900s, there were a group of individuals who got together to exchange ideas. Their focus was to exchange ideas that would help the community, and from that grew the Exchange Club, which is a national organization that's been around for a long time. So the Memphis office of the Exchange Club Family Center began about 30 years ago, and it was a small three-person office down on Elvis Presley Boulevard. And it began with just offering parenting classes because the assumption, of course, is if you can help young parents in raising their children in a safe and secure and nurturing environment, then that goes a long way toward interrupting the possibility of violence being part of children's experience. But what began to happen is that the center was having more and more of the people in the community becoming engaged in the programs. And the question began to be raised, well, what else can we do? Right. Because if you're going to interrupt the cycle of violence, the question is always, well, where do you interrupt? So we began with teaching parents of young children. But then you can also make a case for 
teaching young children to resolve conflicts in a way that's devoid of violence or aggression. Or maybe you could interrupt with teenagers and teach them about healthy relationships. Well, maybe you can interrupt with the victims of violence so that they can heal some of the traumas that they've been through. Well, maybe you can interrupt with the batterers and help them learn other ways to relate. So basically, what began as one program 30 years ago is now over 20 programs. Wow. We love the relationship we have with the training agencies around town. Um, we have a number of undergraduate interns, and I think for many of them, it's their first experience in a service agency. And who knows how much we have sparked in terms of where those undergraduates go from, from their time with us. But our graduate interns are those who are already involved in um, master's or doctoral level training in counseling, social work, psychology. And we offer them the opportunity under the direction and supervision of our clinical staff to work with our families and our kids and gain incredible experience in, um, in clinical work in this environment. But it's a very mutual kind of benefit because we love to have our interns there who are constantly asking us questions, coming up with ideas of their own, and keeping us on our toes. That's Dr. Katherine Collins and Barbara King, who represent the Exchange Club Family Center, receiving the Spark Award from Michael Labone. The final award in this nonprofit category is for organizations with an operating budget over $5 million. MIFA, the Metropolitan Interfaith Association, was founded in 1968 in the aftermath of the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And MIFA was founded by a diverse group of community and church leaders, and they all came together because they knew that together they had a better chance of addressing the problems that plagued our city. MIFA's mission is to support the independence of vulnerable seniors and families in crisis. So we have programs that are aimed at keeping families in their homes and keeping seniors in their homes. And one of the big ones that's really popular is Meals on Wheels. So give us a little bit of context for Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels is one of our largest programs, and I'm really pleased to say that right now, with a grant from the Plow Foundation, we are able to increase that service. But Meals on Wheels, um, we deliver uh, different nutrition interventions to seniors in their homes, and mostly it's hot meals, but also it could be a grocery box or some shelf-stable meals. But also the volunteer that delivers that meal gets to uh, check on the senior and make sure that uh, they're seeing a friendly face every day and it helps combat depression and isolation and makes the senior feel more secure and safe. Talk about the rent assistance and some of the other programs that you provide. Our families programs are really a continuum of services that are designed to prevent homelessness. And we can start with something that is seemingly as simple as rent or utility assistance. Uh, move on to more uh, serious interventions like shelter placement if a family finds they need that, and finally permanent housing if, uh, if that's the solution needed. When you look at the legacy of MIFA starting at a pivotal moment and obviously the work you're doing today, what makes you the most proud of the impact that you're having? We're looking toward our 50th anniversary, which is really exciting, and an, an agency doesn't get to that point without being um, an organization that donors and volunteers see as dependable, as trustworthy, and as a place where they will put their time and their money. So I'm very proud of that. I'm also proud of the fact that, that MIFA is adaptable and that we are looking for new solutions, such as taking on the homeless hotline, being able to expand Meals on Wheels with this uh, collaborative that we're calling No Hungry Senior. That's eight agencies in the community working together, which I think is fabulous. And we want to be able, um, at the end of that grant, to, to almost triple our home delivered meals for seniors. So I'm really excited about that. And that's Sally Hines, Executive Director of MIFA, taking the Spark Award from presenter Michael Labonia of our own WKNO. The value that a community places on education reflects the value that the community places on its children. But more than that, it reflects the investment 
that the community is willing to make in its own future. Because of this importance, the field of education attracts some of our most passionate and idealistic givers. These are people who want to make the world a better place. Education is not just about knowledge or skills. Education entails the development of character, of values, and of personal potential, which in this world is often at great risk of being lost. The institutions and individuals we honor in this category work hard to see that children's potential is not lost, for the children's sake and for our community's sake. Here to present the awards to the champions in our education category is Mike Bowen of Champion Awards and Apparel. We have three awards to distribute in the education category. Our first award goes to a school. Our second award is given to a classroom teacher. And the third award honors an individual of outstanding leadership in education. So, our first award will be given to a school with a unique and powerful sense of mission. St. George's Independent School was originally founded in 1959 on a campus on Poplar Avenue in Germantown. About 15 years ago, there was a pretty vital, or very vital conversation about how the school might be something more. And there were two key decisions. One was to grow all the way through, through the high school. And the other decision was to open up another campus in Memphis on Kimball Avenue off of Getwell Road. So in very short order, the school went from being one campus in Germantown on Poplar Avenue to a three campus school with a 612 campus in Kyerville. And, and certainly if we look at how um, the, the different paths that those kids follow from the Memphis campus and from the Germantown campus, throughout those years, they're getting to know each other. The kids from the Memphis campus and from the Germantown campus come out to Kyerville to learn about ecology, learn about the Wolf River, but they're also learning how to be with each other and how to be connected across those two campuses. And then when they come together in sixth grade, we end up with this amazing tapestry that I think is um, unmatched in, in a lot of major cities in our country. Uh, and, and so I think what St. George's is doing is unique and powerful in the lives of these kids and potentially has a valuable contribution to make to our area. Talk about the culture because it's not only a culture of excellence, it's also a culture of service. At St. George's, when we think about the purposefulness of what we're, what we're doing, and we think about our desire to align with the best ambition of our city, to be part of the answer in our city and our area, I think we have to think about it in the, the, the area of community engagement and volunteerism that if you think about the word engagement and volunteerism, it doesn't exactly center um, fully on whether it's leadership or a leader or a follower. It has to do with serving others, volunteering part of who you are to make the world a better place. Um, this year, 2015, the graduating class of 2016, will have the first cohort of, cohort of students who began as pre-kindergartners at the Memphis campus who are now part of our senior class graduating this year. And so it it's really marks a moment when the school is growing into its full skin. That's Ross Peters accepting the award for St. George's from Mike Bowen of Champion Awards, who's our presenter for this category. Our Educator Award recognizes the achievement of teaching in the classroom and beyond, recognizing the profound influence that a caring and capable teacher can have on young students. Um, I'm teaching at Graham Wood Elementary. I teach the Clue program, which are gifted students. I teach second and third graders. We stumbled upon a, an I Spy book video about how the books were actually made. We watched the video with the kids and we decided, wow, why don't we just make our own I Spy pages? So everyone brought in items and we talked about rhyming and poetry uh, and flow. And then we thought, why don't we put all these together and create actual books? And then we went a little further and said, why don't we donate these books? And that's how we ended up donating quite a few books to St. Jude. And talk about the book club that you started. Well, the book club is with what we call our scholars program, which we, another term is the in-district program, or the students from the neighborhood. We had quite a big gap of, of learning. And in the reading department, that gap was quite great. 
So I asked our principal, I said, what about a book club in the afternoon? I had been to a conference and seen this gentleman that had done it, and he had some really good results. So I decided, well, I teach third grade, so why don't I start with that? And uh, so I went to the third grade kids, and I said, if you'd like to do it, it's in the afternoon. And the next thing I knew, I had 30 kids at my door. My feeling is most kids can learn just about anything. It's making them feel they can, making them think they can, constantly raising the bar for them to show them that just when you're about to reach it, I'm going to raise it for you. Why? Because I know you can. We have a lot of aha moments. You don't exactly know when those aha moments are going to occur, but it is amazing. In my book club, I had a young boy who, who came and he was acting out. He was bothering other children, uh, kind of nudging them when they were reading and, you know, trying to make people laugh. So I kept him after one day and I just said, you know, what's going on with you? I said, I want to know about you. I'm going to tell you some things about me. I want to know some things about you. So we started to chat and we talked and I told him, I said, you are so smart. You don't have to behave this way. You can listen. You can practice. You can think. And all of those things, when you do them correctly, you won't have to act like that. So he started, you know, coming to book club a little more regularly. He was kind of off and on. And then the very first day of school this year, he comes up to me and he says, Miss Trotz, I said, hey, how are you doing? He goes, what day is book club starting? And so what I think is I really inspired him to do more. And I've developed a relationship with his parents who were very nice people, but not that involved. And now they're very involved. So you have the opportunity to affect an entire family. It's pretty powerful. Congratulations. That's great. Grandwood Elementary's Blair Trotz receiving her award from uh, Champions Mike Bowen. We all want good schools and to support good teachers. And what that requires more than anything is good leadership. Our final award in the education category recognizes an outstanding example of leadership and education. A principal who took the helm of a low performing public elementary school and is turning it around for the children of that community. Cherokee Elementary School is a school that is a community based school and when I came to Cherokee uh, my platform was that the work was going to be ICU. The work was going to be intentional, collaborative, and urgent, right? So as I interviewed people, I looked for people who were very intentional, people who were collaborative, and people who had a sense of urgency. Urgency was important. We're talking about a school that has chronically underperformed for years, right? Um, when we entered Cherokee, Cherokee was at 14% in math. Cherokee was at 16% in reading and 24% in science when wow. we entered Cherokee. So year one in math, we moved from 14% to 43.8%. We had the highest math gains in the Shelby County school system. In reading, we moved from 16% to 26.7%. And in science, we moved from 24.7% to 41.7%. Well, we came back year two, and we knew the work was going to be a little bit harder, right? Because we, we, we put up huge numbers. But in math, we went from 43.8% to 65%. In reading, from 26% to 33.2%. So science, we moved from 41.7% to 74%. We had 32-point gains in science. Again, we had the highest science gains in the Shelby County school system this year. When you look at hitting these goals and creating this culture of excellence, what were some of the, the key indicators you put in or key programs that you put in? So with children, it's just a matter of just being consistent, being consistent and having a culture. Every child at Cherokee Elementary School, they know the poem, Don't Quit. We recite it every morning. When things go wrong, as they sometimes will, when the road to Trojan seems all uphill, the rest of you must, but don't quit. So it was really just really having teachers that believe that children can do it and not using words like um, but or however, but using the word yet. At Cherokee, our work is hard work. H-E-A-R-T is hard work. And we find the third way. If the first way doesn't work, the second way doesn't work, we find the third way. There's always a third way. I recall the days that it was cold outside. It was 15 degrees outside. 
And I mean, children came to school in short pants, some, and some came to school in light jackets, right? Some didn't have socks. Not all of our children, but some of our children. And But they were there, right? It's raining outside, I mean, it's pouring down, it's soaking wet, but it does not keep them from coming. And our attendance rate is still hovering around 95 and 96%. They want to be there. They don't want to let us down, and we're not going to let them down. And that's our recipe for success. It's love. Okay. That's Principal Rodney Rowan of Cherokee Elementary accepting his leadership award from presenter Mike Bowen. What difference can one person make? Sometimes we hear that as a rhetorical question, meaning, why bother? So often people underestimate what they're actually capable of. But the reality is the impact one person can have can be powerful beyond belief. We can create massive changes with just a single idea and a deep belief to change the world and our communities. The individuals in the following category understand that impact and believe that one person's ideas can help to create a better society. Now, some call it being a force for good. We call it being a spark. Here to present the finalists for our individuals category is Pierre Landash of the Rotary Club of Memphis. Now, our first award is the Youth Award. And this year we're recognizing a high school student who has made a difference in the lives of children through her promotion of reading. Um, I'm 17 years old and I go to Power Center Academy High School. When I was younger, my parents, they would make me go to my room, get a book, and make me read it to them. And I realized as I got older, like that helped me in the long run. I would always be ahead on reading levels. I would always be ahead on reading tests and stuff like that. So I figured why not help other children and help them get ahead in life, like my parents helped me. And so you've been able to, on your end, be able to bring all these sides together to donate a lot of books. Yeah. So talk about some of the things that you've been able to accomplish. Um, well, my first project, I went to Kip Elementary and I donated, I think, over 100 or 200 books to about 50 families to help them out with their summer reading program. And my second project, I helped out Power Center Elementary and we raised over 300 books. I did a book drive at my high school and we raised over 300 books to donate to the elementary to start them in the library since they were just starting off. So 300 books. So talk about the logistics of pulling all that. How did you, <laughs> how are, especially you know, as, a, as a youth to be able to, to get people and convince them and say, hey, I want you to do this. Talk about how you were able to pull all these pieces together. Um, well, it was difficult at first because a lot of students didn't really want to donate the books. And then we talked about different incentives with my principal to see what they would do. And then we talked about giving them a dress out pass and then they got to choose which school they wanted to go to. So they got a dress out pass and then they chose Power Center Elementary since it was just starting. So they figured it would be cool if we just donated high schools to elementary. And all the students, when they started bringing in books, it started coming in real heavy. Some students, all we asked for was three books from each student, but some students would bring in boxes of books. So we were real amazed to see how involved they were becoming. And outside of books, you've also raised money, over $1,000, correct? Yes, I'm currently raising money along with my high school. They're helping me out once again. They're just like my rock when it comes to drive with to Memphis. They're helping me raise money in order to help out Crump Elementary because they asked me to come to their school to help out their children as well. So talk about community service. What, what have you learned in the process? I mean, obviously on your end, bringing the school together, rallying for the right cause, focused on literacy. What have you learned in the process? Um, in the process, I learned that it's real easy to change a life. You could say one thing, you could change someone's life, and you could make someone happy just by doing one simple thing. And when I gave the books to the children at KIPP, just to see all the smiles on their faces, because it was books that they wanted but couldn't afford, it just made my day. Great. <laughs> Young philanthropist Nakia Brown receiving her Spark Award from the Rotary Club's Pierre Landash. The second award in this individual's category is the Collegiate Award. Not everyone starts college at 18. Our honoree this year started his college career after serving in the Marine Corps. I went into the Marine Corps right after high school. I was 17 when I enrolled. 
Um, I went to boot camp in Paris Island. In 2010, I was deployed to Afghanistan. Uh, I was in Helmand Province in Afghanistan. And that's really one of the times where you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about leadership. You learn a lot about life. Uh, so I got out of the Marine Corps in 2012, and then I started at the University of Memphis in 2013, in the spring semester. In the fall semester of that year, I got really involved with the Complete Professional Program after taking a business communications course with Dr. Toberville. Um, from there, I learned that it was more important to be involved with all the extracurricular activities than it was just to go to class and do your homework and be there for the test and everything. It was all about the extra stuff that you could do on top of it. So I became more and more involved in that and then eventually a leadership position for it came out the blue for me and I jumped at it. It was it was a great opportunity for me. It was something that helped me to get other other students, my peers, other student veterans involved and actually looking at ways to transition, ways to grow in a professional aspect to get in, into the business world. And that was joining the advisory board, correct? Yes, that was. And then later on, I actually had the opportunity to go on to be the co-chair and then the chairman of it. I think one of the biggest things for veterans when they get out of the Marine Corps, they get out of any service in general, they go from having this, this sense of purpose for you, you're alive for the person next to you just as much as you are yourself, you know, and when you get out, a lot of that starts to fade away. There's a big push right now with the, the suicide awareness and the 22 for veterans, um, but for me personally, it's more of a, a factor of you don't, it doesn't matter what's going on for you. If your brother, if your sister needs you, that's where you need to be. So the Veterans Program, the SVBA, the Student Veterans Business Association, uh, this is really a program that we're trying to get involved in to help veterans transition into the professional world. You know, we go through some training when we get out, but in reality, you're not really paying attention to it because you're so focused on, I'm getting out, I need to find a job, it doesn't matter what kind of job, I just need a, some type of income. When you talk about the complete professional program, it's academic success, obviously, and that's a mm -hmm. big part of your story. But it's the leadership components. It's all the, the employability skills, the soft skills. It's yeah. communication, conflict resolution, team building. It's, it's a very, very near and dear cause for me. Um, I was afforded a lot of opportunities when I got out through the University of Memphis, and I feel like it's my responsibility to really go back and look at what I can do for my brothers and sisters once they get out to help them into a situation where they're financially stable, where they're comfortable, where their home lives are stable. So it's, it's all about really giving back and finding that passion and accepting that responsibility to do for others what somebody else has done for you. That's Greg Snook accepting the Individual Collegiate Spark Award from presenter Pierre Landash. The final award in our individuals category is the Adult Award, which goes to a man who truly exemplifies the ideals of service and giving back through the volunteer work at the Calvary Rescue Mission. My volunteerism at Calvary Rescue Mission started in August of 2008 when my son and I returned from a, um, a family um, mission trip uh, with our church at, um, to Guatemala. Uh, we saw terrible need over there, but I wanted my son to understand and appreciate that while there is great need overseas, there's just as much need here locally. And I wanted to uh, have him serve a meal at, um, at a homeless shelter. And one of the people on the trip were already involved with Calvary Rescue Mission. And he said, I got a great deal for you. Come with me and you'll see what uh, homelessness is all about. Uh, the two of us went down there, served the meal, and uh, I absolutely fell in love with the place. It allowed me for the first time in my life to put a face on homelessness and, and put a name with it and, and understand that they're just exactly like me, uh, just their circumstances are a little different. What I intended for my son to learn, I learned even more. Uh, when I go down there, I, no I normally get there about 5.30 in the evening where uh, we serve the meal for uh, the men. They're already in... Uh, the men are allowed to come in at four o'clock. Uh, before they have dinner, they have to go take a shower. 
Uh, fortunately, we have a lot of people who travel a great deal, including myself, and I collect soaps and shampoos from the motels where I stay. Uh, at 5.30, we serve the meal uh, and just sit and talk with the guys about, uh, about life in general, how life is going for them, uh, things that are happening in their lives, and how good it is to see them again. Uh, once they finish the meal, uh, the volunteers that are there uh, clean the tables, clean the floors, clean up the kitchen, and get ready for chapel service. Thanksgiving and Christmas we share with the community around us. Uh, the day before Thanksgiving we prepare uh, meals for 400 people. Uh, the second Saturday in December we have our annual Christmas celebration and that is indeed a treat at uh, Cavalry Rescue Mission because we have more than 600 kids start lining up early that morning. And every kid that's there gets a, uh, a gift bag that's age appropriate and gender appropriate for them and includes a New Testament in there. For many of those kids, this is their only church service for the whole year. Uh, for a lot of them, it's the only toys that they'll get. Why do you volunteer? I volunteer because I absolutely love it. I see the opportunity to, um, I see men who need hope. Uh, it just, uh, it touches my soul to be able to, to see men who have hit rock bottom and to, to, for them to have the opportunity to become productive again. And um, it just, every time I go down there to try and bless them, it blesses me 10 times for, uh, more than what it does them. That's Dennis Rutledge accepting the Spark Award for his work at Calvary Rescue Mission from Pierre Landash. Our final award of the evening is the Legacy Award. This award is created to honor a long career of service, of generosity, of compassion, and hard work. A legacy in something you create over your lifetime and, in turn, leave for others to build upon. Tonight, we honor a person who has spent 22 years building a legacy of hope and help for children and families in crisis. When she stepped into the leadership role at the Exchange Club Family Center in 1993, she found a tiny overwhelmed agency, three workers operating in cramped, borrowed space. With dedication, determination, and elbow grease, she set a course and built them a home on Union Avenue, from which the Exchange Club Family Center has become a powerful force for breaking the cycle of child abuse and neglect. They provide prevention, intervention, educational, and support services to families in an effort to replace abusive and or violent behavior with effective parenting skills. They also help to heal children and families. We're honored to be able to honor Barbara King of the Exchange Club Family Center. I had the very first day that I walked into the Exchange Club Center. It was inside of a bank building with absolutely no signage. And I got there and it was a very small area, very small staff, three offices, and they were there to prevent child abuse. Well, <laughs> three staff members in a small office was not going to obviously make that big of a dent. So I walked in knowing this has got to change. This has got to grow. We've got to educate people about this and provide the services these families need. They need to know where they can come for help. First big challenge was to make us stable financially. There were issues along that line. Um, and the second was to find us another place to, to provide these services. It was not safe. It was not um, client friendly in that area. And I knew we needed extra space if we were going to grow. So we, I set about finding, in addition to educating the community on who we were, which I spent probably 90% of my time on, uh, we had to find another place to be. It's been really good for me and good for all the staff and the community to see how much we do in one spot. The fact that we can have all of our programs under one roof is very advantageous to working with these clients. Um, if they come into one program and they learn to trust us and know that we care about them and we're not the bad guys, they are much more likely to go into another program such as anger management or parenting classes or whatever, where they would not, probably not, uh, take the time to go to five different places and fill out paperwork in five different places. And so it's been very advantageous for us. Did you know or did you have in mind the, the programs that you wanted to bring in or was that 
by, I don't want to say by accident, but mm -hmm. was it one of those where you strategically went out to create these partnerships mm -hmm. to align based on where you wanted to go, mm -hmm. or did it kind of just evolve? It was somewhat of a learning process for me as well. Um, I knew basically what needed to be done, but it did evolve in the fact that if we're going to affect this part of a child's life or this adult victim's life, we've got to attack that problem as well. And so it's kind of just exponentially grown uh, in that process. There's some things I knew we needed to do, but I obviously that's where the staff has come in and it's really been from ground up. They tell us, tell me what's needed. And so we try to provide that if possible. And talk about your support network, because obviously having the team is critical, mm -hmm. but you also have, you, you have the board, you have the exchange club groups. I mean, talk about where your support comes from. Uh, support primarily, obviously, is from the staff and the excellent job that they do and how well-trained and experienced they are. And then also, we've always had a very active board, uh, very committed members who, in addition to raising funds, are very interested and passionate about this issue. We have a lot of volunteers. Some of those obviously come from the Exchange Club Family Center volunteer group that helps with galas and does different things like that. And we also use Exchange Club members as volunteers. And at this point in time, there's five Exchange Club centers in Shelby County. So we get them from a variety of places. We've actually had clients who come back and volunteer several times. Well, going from three to 50 to basically one program to 20, touching 5,000 people a year, mm -hmm. what makes you the most proud? When you look at the legacy, 23 mm -hmm. years at the Exchange Club Family Center, what makes you proud of your legacy? Uh, the families we've seen and the staff. I mean, the fact, their interaction and what they've accomplished. And I know we've made a difference. I know there's, the numbers are horrific in this community. Um, but I know we've touched everyone that we've had a chance to touch. And uh, the community is better educated there's lots more to do in that arena, but they are better educated, and particularly in the fact that children who witness domestic violence are also abused emotionally, terribly abused. Um, it makes me so proud to drive by that building and to see all of those people working together for these children who are so vulnerable. And, uh, I could not do this on my own, certainly, um, but I have an avenue through this to really make a difference. Um, that really drew me to it. I knew so much has to be done and how am I going to do that myself? I couldn't. I said I could say a couple of words and that's about it, but I am very honored to get this award. Obviously it's been a great ride with the Exchange Club Center. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for the second annual Spark Awards. Congratulations to all of our honorees who inspire us for sharing your hearts, for doing amazing things and showing us that one person can make a difference. That's the Spark and thank you for sharing it with us.